Okay, what's happening? I had to hit record just because right before I started the podcast, I started coming up with a new section for this tune. And when I don't hit record and when I don't connect with even the simplest of, uh, of ideas, they'll, they'll disappear out of the brain so fast. Um, it's really frustrating, even tiny fragments, just little chord things that you think, oh, that's really simple. That's just a minor chord. I'll remember that. And then you don't, and you don't remember it quite in the context that you first played it in. And quite often the first performance is the one, it's the most honest. It's the one you heard first. It's the, yeah, it's the, the, the closest to the original idea as possible. So here we are. That's how we're opening the podcast today. It's a bit of a different episode. As you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the total chaos, the opposite view of my studio. Um, Because I'm sitting at the piano, the keyboard here, working on voicings, choir voicings, old school, pen and pencil with the manuscript book. And I'm working on um, one of the pieces for the new album, uh, that we'll be recording in Argentina, um, hopefully with the choir. And it's starting to take shape, um, despite the absolute insaneness and craziness of the schedule um, with everything that's going on elsewhere, uh, with the Giant Steps book and everything that's about to drop and the touring and family just haven't been in town. I'm still managing somehow to find some chord voicings and, and notate them. Piano chops are a little bit rusty. And it's interesting writing for voices, writing for a small choir at the piano. It's such a different concept. Because obviously the human voice behaves completely differently from the piano, but also the voicings and the inner moving parts and notes sustaining over and where you add things and where to crunch, where not to crunch, all these considerations. Just a completely different ball game. Um, and do I want that minor nine, the voicing? Is that really the best use of my melodic options? Should I go back and just play this D minor and just play it twice? And then I want to drop that down. See, I'm going to have, going to have that note sustaining, and then probably be three or four people singing that together. And then I'm going to have um, each person in that section of the choir drop down. So eventually there'll be a there'll be this cluster hanging on above above this minor six interval to make this first inversion D major chord. Um, And do I want do I want this kind of hollow voicing in the middle or more open voicing? Um, and then where do you go? Like all these questions that have to be answered um, through the composing process. That's where I'm at today. That's what I'm sharing. It's um, 
podcast is a little late coming out just because schedule is so packed and there are just actually just way too many projects on the table right now really looking forward to <clears throat> having some of them completed and being able to do more of this um this is kind of where the focus needs to be for the next few months to be ready for argentina and um just nice rebooting that that skill set and uh, uh being very thankful that i did most of my transcription at the piano back in the day like everything i ever transcribed as a kid and like all the bootlegs all the chord changes and voicings and sequences and just everything i was transcribing was at my old acoustic piano with the tape machine on top and rewind 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 um eventually transitioned more to the mini disc and a discman and still kind of old school in the digital realm um but I'm very thankful i spent that time now uh, because the piano skills come right back it's not something that disappears and it's not something i have to relearn you know i, I can hear voicings and play them pretty much on demand not I'm, I'm no i'm no brad meld out here but at least i have the ability to play what i hear which is probably the most important tool on a second instrument and be able to explore more adventurous voicings and do i go up again or do i here or here before I go to the dominant chord and do I have the bass and the soprano go together and then add in the middle voicings or I do have the do I have the just the melody and then the whole chord come in underneath that's all stuff I'm realizing because I haven't written um, this style of vocal music before I think I've talked about this a tiny bit when I mentioned I was trying to use vocals on this new album um, that I have done vocal arranging in a commercial sense, in a pop sense, you know, three, four parts for BVs and for live touring, for instance, arranging vocals for, you know, for live touring acts and even doing a little choir work, but very, very simple. Um, not so much. I, I was, I never had the, um, uh, Never had the okay or the thumbs up from an artist to go a little bit more crazy with the uh, with with all the inner moving inner moving parts and voicings and all that stuff you kind of hear in the middle, especially with more crunchy things like sharp five and and just kind of moving around and changing tonalities and uh, rarely did I get a chance to you know voice things like like that in a, in a pop tune um, or close close crunchy crunchy stuff like that a lot of the pop stuff is you know just basic um, root 5 3 kind of thing and there's some close voicings like some R&B stuff got a little bit hip some gospel st stuff you would be able to like, get a little get a little crunch voicing in there or, or but never really this kind of counterpoint thing. And what I'm realizing is it's good to get the basic framework of the sound um, that I want down on paper or down in a demo in the computer or just a voice note in my phone and then go in and start, you know, adjusting the, the inner parts. Um, and sometimes it's cr sometimes crazy. Like I only get two new notes a day or so. sometimes zero. Actually, you know what? I was thinking like getting two notes is kind of crazy, but actually sometimes zero new notes a day um sometimes it you know for over the past few days when i've had you know very limited time but when i have used that limited time to sit at the piano just just getting the opening sequence of this tune was like has been a challenge uh, and something i've just repeated over and over and over again just those first chords literally that's the first like eight chords right so you, you hear that do you hear the pedal like I, I love that about keyscape it actually has the pedal sound of the grand piano listen hear that and i can actually hit the pedal hard and it, it responds as it would 
as it would on a real piano. That's kind of crazy. Um, I suppose it might be interesting to talk about exactly what is going on here. Um, it's just the first inversion major chord. So that's F, uh, but over the third. So A, F, A, F, C. And uh, that's not Arsenal Football Club, that is A, F, C. And then B major, sharp five. So root, sharp five, tenth. And then same voicing on the F, F, C sharp, A. And then a first inversion, C. So E, C, G. So And then I drop down to minor, just a minor triad, spread triad, another minor spread triad, augmented again. And maybe if you are new to harmony or you're not quite sure, like okay, you can you can identify that as a major triad. Root four one, root five. What well, maybe you, you have some basic knowledge of harmony, but then when you hear this voice you're like oh what is that it's a good exercise just to listen repeatedly and pull out the different notes see if you can sing the root motion um, that's one thing I would pick out you know when I knew very little about voicings and, and very little about transcribing or any of that stuff I would pick out um, try and pick out the root motion so then I at least had a platform to build the chord on um, and maybe the next note was the was the middle voicing that's a little hard actually um, maybe easier to do the top note of the voicing and when you play it like that it sounds actually just as almost as effective I guess without any of the kind of color in the middle, without any of the tensions. And then finally, when my ear was sort of tuned in enough that I could hear those things, I'd start to work on those on those middle notes. So in this case, it was, see how it just thickens up the chord a little bit and then adds a real flavor. Makes it quite a lot thicker. Still only three notes, though. Like, I'm not... Th these aren't, like, crazy... These aren't crazy cluster chords, or, uh... You know, there's nothing... Nothing really crazy like that. It's just three notes. And, and can you feel how much lighter that was when I went from this kind of, uh... This is, like, D-flat over C over D flat it's basically a C triad and a D flat triad but played together and then and then various root notes in the bottom that's quite a dense sound and uh, when we go from that thickness to to this so much lighter and more space even though these are quite crunchy chords when we get to this like this change here makes so simple but so effective then and then we go really diatonic but now we start to get closer voicings And there's some option for in, in, inner moving parts here. Um, so I have to experiment with them. Excuse my voice. I'm terrible and I'm not a soprano. So. I'm trying to imagine that top voice sustaining. And whether it comes in with the downbeat of the melody, so or whether I play 
and come in delayed with the chords there's so many options here and um i know i have to be open to change on the day um to be ready to be like oh okay um maybe this is working better than that or i you know I've talked a lot about on the podcast about the ability to just throw stuff away if it's not working and to, you know, try and make the best use of your time in the studio as a band leader, as a producer, as a composer, um, as a recording artist, and not to get too uh, hung up on like, oh, it has to be this way. And, you know, I won't be satisfied unless we accomplish this exact thing. So there are certain things that I'm going to be really specific about um, that because I know they they work like ahead of time. It's something that maybe is a little more developed as an idea. Um, and I know it can work, but then there are some unknown things that I'm like, okay, if it works great, if not, we can move on to the next thing. And of course I can like knock out an arrangement or a new piece of music pretty quickly in the studio. I'm quite fast when there's a, uh, when there's a constraint or a framework <coughs> that I know I have to exist in or else, uh, or else no, we're not, <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm pretty good under pressure like that. And I'm fairly certain with a project of this size, I'm going to have to employ that skill set at some point because I know there are a lot of variables. And even though I'm surrounding myself with the best possible team, at some point I know I'm going to be like, oh, okay that's not going the way I want it. And I have to pivot and I actually, whoa, maybe I even better, maybe I hear something new and something better in the moment, but I still have to write it and come up with the idea, get the music on the paper and, um, you know, really make that a reality in the moment. That's an A by the way, just the A triad, but with the, with the C sharp in the bass, A, uh, C sharp, A, E, as a five, two, one. And you see this voicing, D, A, F natural. That's something really easy to play on the bass as well. Spread triad, that shape. So root five, tenth, minor tenth in this case, the minor third. Um, notice how I only have to, uh, I leave, leave the center note the same, A, and I change the other two notes, the, the melody and the bass note down a half step. That gets me this five chord in the first inversion, going to the one. So having all of these kind of uh, pieces of micro vocabulary under your fingers are really useful, um, especially on a second or third or fourth instrument, or whatever the piano might be for you um, when you're in the writing process. I don't, obviously, I don't think like, oh, yeah, wow, just got to move it a half step. That's totally natural to me um, at this point. But I am quite often amazed at how much more effective a piece of music will be when I start to strip things away. And when I really get to that, I mean, just, just two notes. played played piano in a long time so my like linear vocabulary uh chops are not fantastic right now even though i can hear obviously you know i'm, I'm, I'm the same person whether i'm holding the bass or the piano so the ideas are there the execution isn't often actually it's a, it can be a nice limitation actually um so you don't get too carried away playing licks and playing stuff you already know it actually forces you to play stuff you it gives you limitations that i think um provide a necessity of simplicity which really helps the music And 
who knows where this is going to go. I'm also um, trying to picture and trying to formulate the the plan in terms of where um, where I'm able to use the choir most effectively and where the choir and the trio meet like what what that marriage is like and and am i having kind of more like is this more of an intro or a prelude or i'm not sure Uh, does the band then come in after this thing happens or is it happening at the same time i definitely have pieces of music i'm working on that 100 percent. it's all at the same time trio and choir Um, and the choir is being used to really highlight the harmony and augment the melody but then there are the little delicate pieces like this. That may have no trio on them at all, and they're just it's just music. And it makes sense in the in the bigger picture of of the of the, of the overall work. I love these clusters, really trying not to overuse them, but haven't gone up with that melody yet I've always been going always been go, been going down there but maybe up is the way we have another nice cluster so we can go and this is how it goes this is how I find stuff regardless of whether I'm talking to you good folk the bass players guys and girls of the music world um, or just sitting here on my own <laughs> quite often in the dark just pondering harmony oh now where no there we go quite like that so no but Still trying to think of that top note, whether the choir is moving kind of uh, horizontally or whether there's counterpoint, like, or vertically rather, like just voicing, 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 or, you know, where the melody is moving. That's what I've always loved about Mahler and Debussy and Saint-Saëns Messiaen, like, all the, well, maybe not so much Messiaen in this style, but um, sort of that romantic period and some classical period of, of counterpoint and inner moving parts. It's not, it's not bark. It's not Baroque. It's not like early like that. It's not, not that kind of thing. It's a little more, um, a little softer, a little more subtle in that sense. So, and then of course, like modern, modern heroes, you know, like Vince Mendoza and people like that who use this stuff to great effect. Eric Whitaker, of course. Man, I really want to interview Eric Whitaker. That would be a really interesting talk. He has some fantastic information about writing for choir, um, writing for voices in general um, on the interwebs. I've been watching a lot of talks of his and some masterclasses and very interesting to hear his take on voicing the choir and having like wider spread. I mean, not... not um, not necessarily revolutionary it's not like he invented the way but he uh, amazingly out of all the music that has happened i think this is what i have the most respect for him for or for anyone actually who can do this is to have a voice and to do something you know part of it i guess is doing it uh for a long time and having the willpower to stick with it and do it so much that that a thing it's almost impossible not to develop your own sound um if you have that dedication to it but most people don't and i think he's one of those great examples of people who um really sort of stuck with the plan and developed over time and he's mr cluster guy like favorite voicing probably of his (laughs) which i love and in a lot of senses, I think I'm drawn to it because there's a lot of elements of there's a lot of elements of jazz in that, and and kind of you know it's not uncommon to use like close 
clustery kind of voicings. Uh, you know, in in jazz, in in when you're comping, you know, and having like uh, um, you know these kind of these kind of sounds, and maybe maybe you've heard stuff like. Um, let's see, what's the best best way to voice that? I would say. Blah, 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 blah. Ooh. It's kind of. We could simplify it. <laughs> Actually, we could put it totally close like that. Two dominant chords superimposed over each other. What's that like? More like Stravinsky kind of stuff. But in a lot of these close voicings, Eric Whitaker's not so much in that sound. He's definitely more in the prettier, you know, the third and the fourth of a major chord, you know. But again, you know, he'll, he'll go. He'll have that, like multiple people singing this note and have them then spread out. Sorry, my voice again is fucking horrible. I'm not a singer at all, but it, you know, the, the rub of these two notes is very difficult to replicate how that, that comes across in a choir. It's a completely different experience as a, as a listener. I'm sure as a singer as well, I wouldn't know. I've not sung in a choir. I'm a horrific singer. Um, I'll probably never experience that, but uh, musically, I understand spreading out those notes under that one sort of rubby note, one that doesn't traditionally fit on a in at home. Like when you go five to one, normally it's it's that triad. Not always. Don't really um, hear that. Traditionally, I hear it like that's one of my favorite places to go is to have the three natural three and four in the in on the major chord on the one chord. I love that, um, but that's one of that's like a very Eric Whitaker voicing. But as I said, the melody starts here, and you would normally, I, I guess, the natural instinct for most people is to go to resolve. So you get that you more. Get that resolution, the suspension to the resolution, but he just leaves it in and then drops another two, three of it, depending on the size of the choir. Singers underneath it, maybe even to a cluster like that. But they're all there, these three people. Um, so I've been, yeah, needless to say, I've been ripping off, needless to say rather, I've been ripping off a bunch of um, stealing, borrowing, shall we say, from that world uh, and bunch of people I actually made a quite a nice uh, let's see if I can find that in the computer while we while we're sitting here um a nice little choral music playlist um oh man I am all super congested must apologize for that as well uh it's been one of those weeks kiddo sick yet again so she's just getting over it and now I'm on the downward turn so it's throat lozenge, throat lozenge city, and completely bunged up, unfortunately. But um, yeah, where's my God? Does anyone else have this? Like the Spotify desktop app is just total garbage. Takes forever. I mean, I know my machine is not like brand new, but just to open an app? Are you kidding me? Uh, where's the I made a little choral music list, so I've got um, I got some Mozart in there, of course, some Fauré, some Eric Whittaker, uh, Morton Lauridson, yeah, a bunch of very cool stuff. And I'm just kind of going through and cherry picking voicings and cherry picking sort of inner melodic moments. I'm not there's stealing and borrowing. Like, what is that thing like? Somebody said, what people say, right? That um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery or something like stealing. No, it's not. I think that's bullshit. Um, especially when it's just a copy of one thing. I think it's when you, when you find your original voice, that's an amalgamation of a shitload of different things um, coming together. So if I were to just play like Eric Whitaker voicings and j just listen to his music and, and then I would end up being way over influenced by his thing. If I didn't listen to Mozart or 
foray or uh, all of these other people that I mentioned, um, it might be really sort of one dimensional and it would end up being a total rip off of one person. But I think we, you know, the, the most original people we've all listened to borrowed and stole and, and, you know, paid tribute to in, in a certain sense as well and cr- credited, um, most of the time, <laughs> the kind people give credit to, to where this stuff comes from. I think it's about the bigger picture, the wider palette of listening that helps with the more original voice of writing. And uh, it's nice to, I guess, you know, we're here in this modern modern era of, di- of information and pretty amazing that I can dial up YouTube and, and see an Eric Whitaker masterclass talking about how he voices how he voices chords and uh, that's actually not a bad <laughs> motion okay sorry so I totally dis- totally distracted here so something brand new coming to my brain right now I have to be so careful of so careful of that it's such a nice melodic uh, motion, but it ends up just being American Elm. nice crunch in the middle there Then the like then the, then the train comes off the tracks. Maybe repeat. Yeah. That's bad, really not. Mm, okay. And then maybe we could, that's where we... It's so easy to get into shit that you know I already know, which is which is a real bummer. You know that that melody uh, line for them. This is so obvious, and and not something I would write for a choir in this in this sense. Uh, 
So, but... I love going from minor to major as well. So if I can, um, uh, oh, let's see where are we. There's definitely, there are definitely some options there. That's nice. Wow. So there it is, folks. That's um, that's how it happens. I'm really glad something original happened and I'm not still just playing the first thing that I opened up the podcast with. As, as much as I like this and I'm happy that it's developing. Also, what I'm doing there as I talk to you is something that... Um, I'm not... If I struggle with it... I struggle with it like... Is this just my ego playing the thing over and over again because I like the sound of it and I like the way I sound or my music? Is it just me, 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 me? But eventually I realized like, oh, actually playing something I've written over and over and over again helps solidify it to the point where I'll never forget it. It'll become really ingrained in me and I'll be able to go and dial that back, uh, back up anytime I need it. And just repeating it over and over again. First of all, I'm going to make a mistake because piano is not my main uh, instrument. And sometimes from mistakes, technical mistakes, simple things that I didn't intend on the keyboard come great uh, ideas for new melodies or new directions or key centers or um, modulations or chord, you know, that kind of shit. Um, And just in general, the repetition of it helps flesh out form in a big way for me. Uh, I really... And if it doesn't annoy me after days or weeks of playing it, if I'm still adding to it and developing it, that's a really good sign that it's going to be, that it's going to make it on the record. So that's, uh, that's why I do that. You know, I'll just inadvertently go back to playing the, the, the most basic structure of the piece. Whoops, <laughs> see? That wasn't a good accident though. That was just Well? Hmm. Maybe that's a better melody note. to some different territory here um, no that was bad but maybe instead of which is what I had before maybe which leads quite well there into the next, into this major tonality. Oh, no. Still can't get that voicing right. I'm not sure what's going on there, what I'm going to... Whole step, but the half step adds... Minor, major, I've overused that a little bit. So these are all the things... These are all the things that are going through my mind. And there was this piece. That I took to Spain last year that we didn't really... Yeah. 
whatever it was. Um, uh, see, one of the things about the recording session last year in uh, in Barcelona was that the piano wasn't amazing, and it wasn't really that inspiring to. Um, to kind of like play piano trio stuff um which was kind of i mean it was what it was it pushed me into doing this record that i'm really proud of and i like the sound of it and we used the pianet another thing that, that happened with it was unintentional was that there was meant to be a fender rose there and when we arrived at the studio the studio owner said ah oh, man he's in the shop and blah 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 blah, and it's not coming by and, but you're gonna have the pianet <laughs> so okay so we had this pianet we're like, oh shit, we're blowing the dust off it and we didn't even know if it works. This is a fucking thing in tune, etc., etc. And it ends up being the sound of the album. So sometimes those happy accidents happen. Um, and there is a solo piano piece at the end of the very end of the record, the last song that Tom plays on his own, like kind of completely composed. I had him just read it down and he improvises a little bit at the end, but the, the bulk of the thing is completely composed. And that kind of worked because it was the piano on its own and there were no drums spilling into it. So we sort of faked a good piano sound uh, as best we could. But it wasn't really a piano with the capability of sitting in the mix with a band. And we were all in the same room. or the drums were in the same room as the piano. So anyway, long story long, um, it wasn't the moment for this. This was, this was a little too pretty and too jazz. And we were going, if you haven't checked out One Way Out, or if, if you have, you know we were going in more of a, I use a lot of pedals on that record, let's just uh, let's just say that, and um, a lot of ambient stuff and groove stuff, and definitely not sort of jazz trio in three kind of waltz shit. <laughs> not that I really want this to be, but as it started off... That kind of sound... It does have that ching ching ta ta ting ding a dang dang a dick a ding dick a dick ding 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 I can't I can't beatbox and um play at the same time, but you know what I mean. But change the context of that and suddenly voice that for twenty-four singers. And suddenly you have something Imagine that. Oh. And maybe, oh, maybe you slide up to the air. There's so many articulation things. Oh. Maybe you can, I can have the whole choir slide into that chord. And instead of being this open voicing with no third, maybe it's, oh. Kind of, we start off. Kind of Kenny Garrett from the '90s, and we in the, by in, by two chords later, we're Eric Whitaker in 2009 or something. So we're definitely combining influences here and drawing upon that material. That I was kind of sad not to have been able to use that piece of music. I really like the. I love this section. I thought it was quite, quite delicate. Um, uh, I can't remember actually the the rest of it. I have a chart somewhere, but goes into this whole descending thing and but there's harmonic language there even if i don't use it in the same context as i wrote it for what i thought would go on that last album voicing these things and trying to that's the other thing i'm going to have to work on is how low can i voice these clusters like is that range really going to work it does that work in like is that like baritone or something i don't know where that's going to be um is it ten? I'm not sure. Like we're gonna have to see like who we get. Like I don't know the singers. Are we gonna get eight and then stack them? Um, are we gonna have a whole day? Is it gonna be a half day? Like how how much budget is there left? You know, 
We're doing the pre-sale, obviously, which is definitely helping out the entire situation and helping to, you know, scale up the the, the size of the project and and the the eventual result of kind of how epic it gets. And that's amazing. We've we've definitely uh, put some money into the budget from your very generous pre-sales. So I appreciate that, or yeah, purchases rather. Um, so that's been amazing. But if that can continue then maybe we're going to have this choir for a whole day and maybe it's not eight it's 12 people like who knows uh but at the end of the day i really have to know like where this voicing is going to fit for instance if i decide to take this piece of music and how how is that how is that going to rub you know i think they're going to have to sing straight tone or vibrato to get these notes to sound in tune but to still rub the right way and then, and then do I, do I really double the melody there, the, double the root note, or do I make it more open like that? There's all these, all these questions, you know, that sounds not thick enough now, so that sounds more like it, and then I can keep this voicing in the right hand, F, G, C. One one two five. Walk up from D flat. So it's like flat six, flat seven, one, D flat, E flat, F. Wow, that's low. I'm not I'm not any of these voices basically. Um sit there and do we have this middle f in there or is it a straight fifth in the in the in the lower end and then a cluster in the top and do we you know do i get that descending you know maybe that's it like the root and the melody So many options there of uh, of inner moving parts, and of course, so many options means like doesn't mean like you got to use them all all the time. So it's way overplaying in this situation right here, I think, and then stripping it away to what makes the most impactful musical statement. I think if that's one thing, that if that's if, if there's one big thing that has developed throughout my um, throughout my life of making music and understanding music it has been that to like not be not have verbal diarrhea on stage not overplay like crazy um but if i am going to experiment and dig super deep into the music and you know potentially overplay then do that in the practice studio you know and do that when i have the time and again record 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 yourself all the time um just so you can listen back and be like, oh, shit, man, that is too much. <laughs> now I know. And there's no excuse to do it again. You know, I know that is absolutely too much and it's to your taste. And that sort of feeds into creating your own voice as well because it's going to be so honest. You remember, sometimes, Maybe it is dense what you're playing, but if you really dig it and that's what excites you and inspires your, 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 your curiosity, then, it, that, then it's right. You know, you have to figure out. It's not just, oh, it's a lot of notes, so it's wrong. Oh, it's really thick, and there are these like crazy, vo- crazy voicing. So it's wrong, you know. It doesn't all have to be all super pretty and major and diatonic. It can be it can be weird and dense and thick and verbose. But only you are going to know how you feel about it if you keep recording yourself and listening back and giving positive, you know, positive critique. Um, 
to what it is you're doing. Sorry, throat lozenge, still in here. Um, yeah, so with everything that's going on, the schedule being totally insane, I think that's going to be it for today's already late episode. And mm, there's that one. I'm just picturing that that B flat re. Uh, if, uh, I didn't even want to go down to the A, but it must be hard to sing in a choir that has to sing this shit. That's the other thing. You don't want to destroy your musicians either. Like be be kind to them. Challenge them, but don't don't be an asshole, you know? <laughs> I just love it. I can listen to this shit all day long. Voicings are just it's just too much fun. Mmm. And what's that major triad with the four and the flat nine? And you want to go real cluster, do the same thing, but with a sharp nine. Or maybe you want to voice that out like, um, uh, uh, maybe major seven at four, sharp nine. And then that's just B my B flat minor seven flat five over F major. <coughs> Love voicings like that. And this is what I'll do. I'll just play the voicing and see where where the overtones take me. I'll do it dozens, if not hundreds, of times like that. <laughs> and see where it goes. You know, I've done, if you've checked out Chordal Harmony before, my book, there are a lot of exercises in that where you take a melody note and you figure out all the bass notes under them and what they do. Um, basically, every melody note works with every bass note. You can, that's the concept. You, you have C here, you can be C major, you can be B7 flat 9, uh, B, um, B flat minor major, F over A, A flat uh, augmented, G major cluster. This is not like a chord sequence I would build, but just as an example of all just descending chromatically in the left hand with the bass note and the, and the melody note hasn't changed so you know every melody note works with every bass note in some form or another so the fact that I have that that option in my vocabulary um, uh, when I get to that note that's that's why I arrived at that chord And so it develops. So many options. And this is it. Nerding out in the studio with the piano, with the chords, probably one of my favorite things to do, especially with the anticipation building of going to do the record. And that really, that's exciting. Like that's the most exciting shit to me, musically speaking. <clears throat> that's why I'm trying to grow the main channel. It's going to be an epic failure of trying to reach 100,000 people by the end of April. That's only like two weeks to go, and we're not even close. So I got to make a video about that and um, talk about why and what's up. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a tough video to make. Always um, never easy admitting that you were wrong or that something didn't work out the way you wanted. But there are some positive things to come from it. And for everyone who did start subscribing to the main channel and of course this channel on youtube for the podcast really appreciate that and that is huge and it has helped in a big way in just a couple of short months things have changed a lot on this end and i will share a lot about that in, a, in an upcoming video this week on the main channel about youtube and about 
the journey so far so watch out for that and um my voice has finally given up for the day so i'm on uh voice rest and maximum warp speed work to get the to get the um giant steps book finished today i have the first draft it looks fucking amazing chelsea knocked it out of the park cover looks amazing just trying to figure out the <clears throat> play alongs and the videos where to host them potentially doing something new with that giving people better control better access <clears throat> maybe being able to download all that stuff immediately on the sale i don't know we're, we're trying to figure it out and in the next two days maybe this is going out on monday the book should be out by wednesday or thursday so look out for that yannickwasdala.com tour dates are up um south america argentina we have our anchor date in buenos aires on august 5th so that's happening buenos aires is happening live show with my trio august 5th we're building the rest of the tour around that we're looking at brazil uh blue note in sao paulo um uruguay paraguay chile and maybe one more gig in the south of argentina not sure yet there could be a festival there but I'm um, very excited about that. Always stay updated on the Substack. Everything is linked in the show notes or below the video if you're watching on YouTube. And that's it. See you guys next time.